Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Artistry of White Ink. This is the second installment of our Indigo Edge series. Um, I'm Matt Richardson. I'm one of the co-owners of Indigo Inc. And we're joined by Liz Richardson, my wife. Um, she's the other co-owner. And uh, we're also joined by Alex Donahoe. He's our lead press operator, chief of research and development, and our mad scientist in residence. And uh, we're also joined by Daylin Ogden. Uh, she's going to get a, a, a much better introduction by Alex a little bit later. She's our guest uh, today. Uh, she's one of our clients, but like I said, Alex will talk a bit more. Um, and uh, we're excited that so many of you have uh, taken the time to, to join us today. So thank you. In case you don't know us, we're Indigo Inc. Um, we're in Columbia, Maryland, and uh, we're an eco-friendly, wind-powered, people-powered digital printing company. And uh, we have an amazing team of uh, really hardworking people who all love paper print and problem solving. Um, we do a lot of research and development here. Um, it's not just Alex, but a lot of the team does research and development. Um, he's our only mad scientist, but others do research and development. Um, and uh, we're really excited to share with you about um, some of our you know, printing techniques and em embellishment techniques, um, specifically Today, we're gonna to talk about white ink, and uh, so that's why we're here. Um, and if you received a uh, packet in the mail, it would be helpful for you to pull those samples out. You probably already did that. And um, we're gonna be referencing them throughout the session. Um, after the session, um, I encourage you to download all of the files, the sample files from our website. It's on the resources section under sample files. And the reason why uh, we have those there for you is so you can kind of deconstruct these files just in case um, you, you want to set up something similar. If you deconstruct the file, uh, you can see exactly what we did to set up these, um, these files for printing. Um, but bef So we'll get to that uh, file set up in a little bit. But before we do that, I'm going to turn this over to Alex. He's going to uh, review some, some things that he'd like you to know. So Alex, it's all yours. Thanks, Matt. Give me just a second here. Sure thing. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the sophomore outing of Indigo Edge. We have an exciting itinerary for today, but before we dive into the practical and creative applications of white ink, let's establish a good foundation of understanding what white ink is and how it differs from traditional CMYK printing. White ink is made from titanium dioxide, a pigment responsible for its opacity and vibrant white hue. The pigment is not unique to ink. You probably use products that include this compound every day without realizing it. Titanium dioxide can be found in paint, cosmetics and sunscreens, food, pharmaceuticals, and plastics. It's non-toxic and can be found almost anywhere a bright, durable, and inexpensive white finish is needed. White ink works like any other spot color on the press and can be used to create any level of opacity, including gradients. We have two machines that can print in white. While the color is the same, there are significant technological differences that can impact your project. So let's compare the two machines and explain where they excel and where they can struggle. Our main production press is an HP Indigo 7900. It is an incredibly powerful piece of hardware and uses a novel combination of technologies to produce some of the highest quality images possible to find on a commercial printing press. As a hybrid digital and offset machine, the Indigo offers the best of both worlds and that extends to white ink. Indigo print technology is complex and unique within the industry. But the press is capable of one very important trick that it's important to grasp before moving on. Most printing presses use a non-stop printing process. Paper goes in one end and out the other, with ink or toner being put down as the paper passes underneath the color stations. Indigo printing presses use a set of three metal drums, with the smallest, called the impression drum, containing a set of physical gripper blades that clasp the edge of the paper, wrapping the sheet around the drum as ink is transferred onto it. Because these gripper blades are electronically controlled, we can hold a sheet inside the indigo, laying down many more layers of ink than would be possible on another machine, up to 16 in total. 
That allows us to use white ink in combination with a wide variety of other colors using any of the other six ink stations in combination with white or successively hitting white ink multiple times to achieve a higher contrast and crisper image. In addition, the offset heritage of the indigo is a huge advantage in working with white ink. During the printing process, layers of ink are transferred to a soft, heated silicone blanket. This blanket softens the ink particles before they meet the paper, while the soft surface of the blanket conforms to the texture of the paper, squeezing the molten ink into every crevice of the material. This process is repeated four times every second, building a full color image at the rate of 60 times per minute. The caveat to all this printing horsepower is that the indigo doesn't work on just any paper. Some indigo certified paper has been coated with a primer that allows particles of ink to adhere properly. Other manufacturers produce materials that are pre-formulated to work with the press. We can add this primer before printing, but it must be done one sheet at a time and the results are not a guaranteed success. We tend to be a little picky about what materials we permit to be run on the indigo for this reason. In comparison, the Oki is a more traditional laser printer, like what you might have in your home or office. It uses a powdered toner, which is transferred to the paper through static electricity before being melted in place by a hot fusing roller. The Oki is slower than the Indigo and can't pull off the same tricks, but what it can do is print on almost any paper and on small sheets, even four bar envelopes. It's worth noting that the Oki can struggle with textured materials. Because the fuser roller is made of hard rubber, it cannot force toner particles into deep crevices. Some challenging materials can print with a patchy, uneven appearance, and this can include some color plan papers. With any supplied stock, we always recommend asking us before purchasing materials to be used. We've seen just about every issue imaginable, and we're more than happy to offer our professional opinion. Color plan has begun introducing indigo certified stocks that run more smoothly, so if you're interested in using their lineup in a project, it's well worth checking to see if your desired color is available in an indigo-ready version. You'll often find these stocks referred to as indigo certified or iTone. In the first episode of Indigo Edge, we covered spot colors and file setup in great detail. If you missed it, that episode covering digital foil, metallic inks, and similar special effects is available in its entirety on our YouTube channel. Liz will put the link in the chat. We won't spend too much time today retreading old ground, so let's take a few moments for a quick review of how spot colors work on the indigo before moving on to new material and explaining how file setup works for the Oki. A spot color is any ink outside of the standard cyan, magenta, yellow, and black printing process, including white. To print white ink, particularly when combined with other colors, it must be defined as a spot color within a file. In Illustrator, any element can be converted to a spot color by adding an appropriately named spot swatch and applying it to the design with overprint enabled. Ensure the new swatch is assigned as a spot color and that you've selected a bold, simple color to highlight the layer within your file. The color you select does not matter. It is only to indicate the spot ink. Make sure the white ink elements are on their own layer, which should be included above the CMYK design in the layers panel. Don't worry if that went a little fast. We'll be reviewing all of this with Matt in just a moment. In Photoshop, adding a spot color is accomplished by making a selection and converting it to a spot channel. There are several ways to achieve this, but in most cases, it's done by holding down control and clicking add under the channels tab. We'll see a great example of this towards the end of the session. Files for the Oki are even easier. Let's look at three options. Oki files that will use white toner exclusively should be set up in 100% black. When sent to the printer, we tell the software simply to swap the black in the file for white in the machine. When printing CMYK on a dark stock, no special handling is required. Again, the printer software will automatically insert white toner behind any colored elements. Set your design up the way you like and we'll do the rest. The only tricky part is using mixed white toner and CMYK. Here, you do need to set up a second layer in your file. Call this layer white 
and make sure it's located above the layer containing the CMYK elements. Elements within this layer should be assigned a spot color called spot color underscore white and have overprint enabled. This is the same process we use for the indigo, but with a different naming convention. Let's check in with Matt for a few minutes to see all of this in action. So everybody, this is Matt again. Um, we're in uh, Illustrator and I'm gonna show you how to set up an envelope for printing on our Oki printer. Um, this, is, this is a more complicated file because like Alex said, if you just wanted to print just white toner, you would set the file up as 100% black and let us know you wanted to print white and then that's what we do. Um, this one's a little different. This, um, this sample, I'm gonna hold this up. It's a, probably can't see it. It's a uh, pink envelope and there's some white toner and some CMYK elements. Um, so first things first, like Alex said, um, you're gonna set up your basic, you can use InDesign or Illustrator the same way. You're gonna have a layer. Um, and on one layer, you're gonna have your white. And on another layer, you're gonna have your CMYK um, and you're gonna label that. Um, I've got another layer hidden here. I'll show you a little later what that is, just in case you're wondering. Um, so basically, Everything, in, in, in this case, the envelope is, is light pink. Um, so we did not add white under the, the Indigo logo and, and the blue because it didn't really need it on the, on the pink envelope. Um, but if we use a dark envelope, this is what I'll show you later, we would need to add white ink to print underneath all the blue. So it shows up. So in this case, um, what we did on the CMYK layer, we just set up our CMYK artwork, super simple. And credit goes to uh, Pete Birch for setting this up. He's on the call somewhere too. Uh, and secondly, um, anywhere where you want there to be white toner, you're gonna have it on this second layer. You're gonna label it white and you're gonna call it spot color white. And it has to be capitalized and there's an underscore in there. It's a little convoluted and sorry, but this is how the software understands it. Um, so it's spot color underscore white, and all of the words are capitalized. So what you do, you create your document. This is a fancy design. Um, clearly, I did not make this. Um, like I said, Pete Birch, he's the mastermind. Um, all of the white, you set it up using that spot color. And all you have to do is make sure you click overprint fill under attributes. Um, that's it. And then everything that's pink in this, in this particular case, because we set up the spot color as 100% magenta, uh, that will print in white ink. Now, like I said, if you have a darker envelope, you're gonna wanna add white toner to print underneath the CMYK. Otherwise it would just bleed into the, the darker background. So that's what this third layer is for. Just to show you, I'll flip it on and off. You can kind of see how I have white on top of the CMYK. And I know it doesn't make sense to put it on top, but that's just how the uh, software works. You put it on top of what eventually it'll print under. Confusing, but it works. Um, when you do that, you also make sure you set it to overprint. And once you do that, you save it as a PDF and you're done and it's ready to go, ready for us to print. Uh, we always test, just, just in case anybody's wondering, we always test everything before we print. Um, make sure there's no problems. Uh, if there is, we'll, we'll let you know. Honestly, what's probably going to happen is we'll try to fix it ourselves. And if it gets too complicated, we'll let you know. Um, so rest assured, even if you're not 100% sure, if you did it right, we're going to check to make sure it is right. Uh, that's it, Alex. I'm going to stop sharing and send it back to you, sir. Thanks, Matt. One of the simplest but most striking uses of white ink is a full opaque design on dark stock. Take a look at Feather Sample 1. This is the easiest file to set up, and there are a couple ways to do it. The first option is to set up a file, come on, set up a file with a white spot channel in either Photoshop, Illustrator, or InDesign. This spot color should be called HP White 1 with the exact spelling and capitalization you see on screen. Any part of the file with this spot color name will be printed in white ink. 
No adjustments or special considerations are needed on your part. Just send us your file and we'll do the rest. You'll hear us reiterate this several times, but whenever we use whiting, we always apply four layers to ensure a crisp, brilliant finish. The second option can be used in any program if you can't create a spot color. Create your design in a single process color. This can be 100% black, cyan, magenta, or yellow. We suggest black just to avoid any confusion. Make sure you don't use any kind of rich black or other mixed color build. When we receive your file, we will tell our press to print the color in your file using white ink, using a simple drop-down menu, and the file will print in white according to your vision. There are no real restrictions on white ink when it's used in this fashion. Pick any colored stock on either machine, craft any design you can dream up, and we'll make sure the finished product brings it to life. White ink by itself is great, but it can be a little uh, monochromatic. So let's add a bit of color to the mix. If you attended our last webinar, Shimmer and Shine, Art Sample 7, or Mars, might look familiar. We previously showcased a version of this file that used soft touch laminate and gold foil. This version uses the same art, but now we've replaced the printed red with Nina Classic Press Red Pepper cover stock. A layer of white ink has been added under all the remaining design elements, and the off-white portions have been deleted to showcase the white ink by itself. This is a beautiful example of one way to play with color. By using the paper itself as a design element, you can treat the entire printed surface as a spot color, achieving shades that would be impossible to print, and a depth and uniformity of color that no printing press can match. On top of that, try angling the print toward a strong light source. The multiple layers of ink produce a strong sheen against the matte surface, which can be used for creative effect. If you need even more shine, transparent foil can be added for a true gloss on matte effect. Contrast works in both directions. As we exit Halloween, let's say you want to lend a design a more ghostly appearance. White ink can be applied to white paper for a subtle simplicity on both coated and uncoated stock. We've seen some amazing applications of this technique, and it provides a sense of luxury and class to every project. The brighter the paper, the less contrast you'll find in the finished product. Make sure you refer to our swatch book to find the material you need. White ink can be laid down in any level of opacity, opening the door to some amazing depth and eye-catching effects. Everything we've talked about so far uses a single spot color, HP White 1. Think back to the overview of the indigo print technology from earlier. A single layer of white ink won't achieve the look of appearing truly white. So to produce this effect, we hold the paper inside the press and hit HP White 1 four times to achieve 100% opacity. If you set up a file with a mix of opacities, we still need to hit the spot color four times. This is an additive process, so setting HP White 1 to 10% will look closer to 40% opaque. This means targeting a specific level of opacity is not as simple as just changing the opacity in Illustrator. Instead, there's a clever but slightly mind-bending trick we can use. If you refer to Feather Sample 8, we're going to take a deep dive into how these effects were set up. If you haven't already downloaded the Illustrator file, do so when you have an opportunity. You'll find a link in the chat. You're going to want that one handy for reference. What you're looking at here are four separate white spot colors, HP white 1, 2, 3, and 4. Each spot color is hit once, and each has a mix of opacities, with certain elements being duplicated across the four layers to produce brighter whites. Think of the opacity range for white as ranging from 0 to 400%, with each of the four spot layers adding up to 100% to the total. As we mentioned earlier, this is an additive process. So by varying the opacity of elements and stacking them across layers, you can target very specific levels of brightness. It's worth noting, however, that anything beyond about 225% opacity becomes difficult to see any difference. We suggest keeping your contrasting elements below this range for maximum effects. I'll turn things over to Matt to break down the construction of this file and provide some more detail on how it all works together. All righty. So 
this is the one that I'm uh, I'm going to say, hang in with me because it's complicated. <laughs> uh, this one uh, is is the sample, the feather sample uh, on black paper with white ink. Um, this is one of my new favorite things. We've we've done this for many years. Um, clients that are on this call right now have have done various versions of this um, in in different ways throughout the year. But we we really put some thought behind this one to kind of create it a, a better system so that um, we can teach it and we get better results. So this is using white ink in various opacities to to create kind of a layered effect. You know, kind of give it a three D look. Um, and again. Our, our designer, Pete Birch, came up with this design, it, and I love it. It looks great. It's very simple. It's just white ink, but it looks amazing. Um, so this one uh, is a little different from anything else we've, we've done so far, and it is a little complicated. So don't forget, you can download these files on our website. You can play with them. You can also call us if you're having trouble. We're always happy to help, um, and, and you know we're just a phone call away. Uh, so. We, we organize this one a bit differently. Uh, you'll notice in my layers uh, panel here, we have four different layers and each layer relates to the number of hits of white ink we wanna have in those layers. So for instance, I'm gonna turn off layer two through four so you can just see layer one. Everything on this layer is just one hit of white ink in various opacities. So the one I have selected here, you see it's 40% opacity. Um, some of them are 10%. And um, those are going to be the lightest elements you see on this sample. Um, and you you can also see uh, why um, even even the the darkest white, uh, darkest white doesn't make sense, the brightest white, um, is going to be four hits of 100% white because if we don't do that, one hit of white is not, a, one hit of 100% white is not enough to, to make a really, nice, dark, opaque white. Um, but because of that, we, we realize, you know, you can use that feature as, as a design element. And that's what we're showing you here, where you can get different layers and opacities. So on the first layer, I just picked these feathers and made them different opacities. So a lot of these are 10% to have some lighter ones in the, in the background. And this one's 40%, this one's 20%. And uh, when you do that, you're gonna make this HP white one. So as a spot color, this is gonna be set to, I made it 100% magenta and we made each of these spot colors a different color. So it's just easier for us to see it in the file. I suggest you do the same thing. It could be different colors, but I would make them distinctively different. So everything on this layer that's gonna get one hit is called HP white one. And it's set to 100% magenta again, so we can see it easily. So this is where it gets a little tricky, but not so bad yet. So this is our second layer. And what I intend on this layer is for everything on this layer to be hit with two hits of white ink. So everything on this layer is called HP white two. And again, it's a spot color. When you look in there, you'll see it's uh, set to a spot color. And we made this one 100% cyan, so it's easy to see. So the intention is for everything on this layer, we're going to hit it twice but there's some file setup that we're gonna review in a little bit that we have to do once your design's ready to make it work on the press. And this is something that you're gonna do in the file before you submit it to us. So just like the two hits of white ink on the three hits of white ink layer, everything on this layer is going to uh, be hit three times. You know what, I need to back up. I forgot to mention something. On layer two, everything on this layer I have it set to 60% opacity, and that's important. So everything on this layer is set to 60%, but it's going to hit twice. So it's going to be effectively 120% white ink. And that that is what um, is gonna give us that layered look. So on the second layer, I suggest 60%. On the third layer, everything on this layer is going to be set to 75% opacity and it's going to be hit three times. So it's going to be effectively 225% white ink. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Don't forget we have a Q and a session at the end, if you have any questions. Um, 
And then on the last one, four hits of white ink, this is going to be our most opaque white. We're going to hit it four times, and we have this set to 100% white. So this is how I would suggest designing it. You're going to design it in four layers, but this isn't quite ready to print. So what I'm going to show you next is what you have to do to make it work to print. And again, it's a little complicated, so hang in there. So I'm going to turn off layer four. I don't need to do anything on layer one because it's just one hit. It's all ready to go. I'm going to turn off layer one and turn on layer two. Now, everything on this layer is set for HP white two. But in order to get this to work, we need to copy everything. And then we're going to paste it in place. I'm going to do that now. And we're going to tell it that it's HP white one. So what happens is when this prints on the press, the first pass of white will give it 60%. And then the second pass of white, HP white two, will give it another 60%. And that will equal 120% opacity. And this is easy. Um, this is not that complicated, this one. And just make sure you set it to overprint. That's important. If you don't set it to overprint, it won't work. So layer two is set up. It's ready to go. So we're going to turn that off. And layer three is effectively the same thing. So when I select this, you'll see it set up as HP white three. In order to make this print right, we're going to copy everything. And we're going to paste it in place. And I'm going to call this HP white two. And it's set to overprint. I'm going to do the same thing and set it to HP white one. So now there's three layers of white ink. And I'm going to show you here one, two, three. And each of those layers are set to 75% opacity. So when they print on the press, it'll effectively be 225% opacity. Hopefully this makes sense. So now layer three is set up. And layer four is exactly the same way. You just select everything. And in this case, I've got some uh, strokes uh, set to white. I'm just going to worry about the um, feathers for now, just to make this easy. So the feathers, anything that you want four hits of white, you're going to copy that, paste it in place, and you're going to set that as HP white three. And then you're going to do it again, set it as HP white two, and again, set it as HP white one. The whole time, since you're copying the layers and they're already set to overprint fill, it's going to keep that overprint um, setting. And again, there's four layers of white ink all set to 100% opacity. So when these print, you're going to get 400% white, and it's going to give you the brightest, whitest white. Um, and all you do after that um, is save it as a PDF and send it to us, and it's ready to go. I know that was crazy and complicated, but it really works. Uh, we're always happy to help. Uh, it, we'll, we'll let you know um, if you send us a file, if anything needs to be adjusted. And like I said before, we, we normally will make an adjustment um, unless it gets a bit complicated. And um, we'll also give you feedback and let you know so that next time, you know, you'll get it right. All right, Alex, that was the most complicated one. And everybody stayed awake. So this was good. Thank you, guys. Alex, I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you, Thank you Matt. That's actually really encouraging. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> I was worried about that one. With all of these creative concepts under our belt, we also want to touch on a few applications of white ink that are purely utilitarian. These are techniques that require the use of white ink to be successful and can be used as a great foundation to expand on the applications we just discussed. Let's go back to the Mars sample for a moment. This file uses a mix of white ink as a standalone element and white ink under CMYK. There's a bit of file setup trickery happening here to make this work, so let's take a closer look. When white ink and CMYK are used in conjunction with an edge-to-edge -edge approach, mm, sorry, there is a risk that tiny slivers of ink will peek out. White ink is thick and tends to expand as it's melted into the paper, so it will occasionally seep out from under an overprinted design. To avoid this, we contracted the white ink layer by a tiny amount so this expansion would result in full coverage without the white ink showing up. This step isn't necessarily required. In many cases, the slivers of white are barely noticeable. 
we're more than happy to check your file or run a proof to see if there will be an issue before printing the full run, but there's never any harm in setting your file up with the white layer adjusted in advance. Finally, the contraction is very minor. This file in Photoshop resized the selection by about two pixels. In Illustrator, reduced the size of the white ink layer by around 0.2 points. Now, let's turn to Feather Sample 7. If you attended the Shimmer and Shine webinar, you'll have seen this one already. As we reviewed in that class, white ink must be added when printing metallic on uncoated stock. The white ink acts as a filler compound, preventing the silver ink from sinking into the paper and preserving its reflective properties. This white ink layer should be added to metallic ink designs on both white and colored stock. Look at the Illustrator file for this feather as a reference on how the layers work. White ink and metallic ink are always set up on their own layers in reverse order from how they'll be printed. If the printed order will be white, silver, CMYK, make sure your file contains CMYK, silver, and white on three layers from bottom to top. Let's go back to Matt for a moment to review how this file is assembled. Okay, well, lucky for everybody, this one's a lot easier. Um, and, I, and I should always remind everybody on the call that all of these um, files are available on our website. And if you download them, you can pick them apart. And I think it'll give you a good um, like a, a template to set up your own files. And again, if you have questions, just let us know, we'll help. So this one is the feather sample. And again, like Alex said, we went over it on the last call uh, for Shimmer and Shine, but this is a really cool effect. Um, it's the one that has metallic ink on white paper. Um, and, and this one, the, the reason why we're talking about white ink on this particular one, even though you don't see it, it's, it's used as a tool to um, keep the paper from soaking up too much of the metallic ink. Because if, if we didn't use white on this one, the metallic ink would soak into the paper, then you wouldn't have a really nice metallic effect. So really, in, in, in this one, you're not seeing the white. It's just there as a tool. Um, so this one, like other ones, we have three layers. Um, we have our CMYK layer. We have our white ink layer. And we have metallic. And I know, I know Alex showed the illustration where white was on top and metallic was between. It, it will work either way, because we can tell the press um, how to you know how to put the layers down. But they they will have to be set to overprint the white and the metallic. Um, so under, I'm sorry, on top of the uh, CMYK layer, we add a white layer. And just like always, we name it HP white one. We create a spot color and name it HP white one. And it's cal uh, capitalized and spelled just like it is here. And we set it to 100% magenta. Um, that's just, Again, easier for us to tell the difference between the two colors. Um, and then we always make sure these are set to 100% opacity. And then we do the same thing for the metallic layer. This is also a spot color and it's called HP metallic right here. And it's set to 100% cyan. And this is also set to overprint. And then I'm gonna make sure all my layers are turned on when I make my PDF. So from here, all you do is export the PDF and it's ready to print. When it goes to press, we'll see, Alex will see, that there's CMYK art, white, and silver metallic. And he'll know what to do and it's gonna come out pretty. Um, if, so in this particular case, this is printed on an eggshell paper. It's, an, it's a really nice uncoated paper stock. If you were doing the same design, but it was on a coated paper, silk or gloss, you don't need the white ink layer. You can just turn that off save the PDF, and then we'll print using just CMYK and metallic. So the white is important as a tool in this case because we're printing on uncoated. It's not necessary if you're printing on a coated paper. That's it for me, Alex. Back to you. Thanks, Matt. Sure thing. We work with a lot of incredibly passionate, talented artists and designers, and I love bringing their ideas to life. I've been tasked with executing some pretty outlandish projects over the years, and there's really not much that surprises me at this point. So when something crosses my desk that I've never seen, I take note. 
Daywon Ogden has been working with us for several years, and the projects she brings us consistently push the boundaries of production and challenge us to think outside the box. Her work is hard to pin down, with an intersectional approach to folklore, esotericism, gender roles and identity, and a color palette that pushes our press to its limits. Daywon's illustrations are always compelling, sometimes grim, and inevitably beautiful. What I admire most about Daywon's artistic technique is that I've never seen her approach a project without considering how it will look when put to paper. Daywon has an insatiable curiosity for print and conceptualizes her artwork with an eye for the finished product, often incorporating special effects and exotic substrates in the name of realizing a vision that goes beyond the confines of the files she creates. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce her in this installment of Indigo Edge. Please welcome Daywin Ogden. Shaw, you're going to make me blush. Jeez. <laughs> As an aside, I always really love seeing like um, when people talk about my work, which pieces they choose to showcase. I always think that that's like really fascinating, especially having been, uh, you know, online for as many years as I have been, just you have so many years of work to go through. And I always wonder what goes through people's heads when they, uh, when they choose things. Uh, but anyway, that said, um, thank you guys so much for having me. As Alex said, my name's Dalen Ogden. I've been a full-time comic artist and illustrator for about a decade now. And uh, even though a lot of that has been spent feeling like a raccoon in a propeller hat in the professional sphere, I am still super, super excited to share what I have learned about incorporating like specialty printing stuff into your work. Uh, I have put together my own much less fancy and beautiful slideshow, so we're going to get into it. Uh, let me get that queued up. All right. Do, do, do. Go and... Okay. Uh, oh, is it is it playing? Has it gone full screen for you guys? Yeah, well, you'll need to go back to your screen share and select the full screen version of the PowerPoint presentation to share. Full screen version. Oh, gosh. I should have troubleshooted this beforehand. Um, do you know where that is? Uh, I think if I you stop screen, screen you stop yeah. screen share and then start over. OK, yeah, let me do that. OK, sorry about this, everybody. Um, OK. Totally fine. Make sure the PowerPoint presentation is full screen and then go to your screen share and you should see a new window available. That's what I should do. You're right. Um, oh gosh, for some reason that is not wanting me to, it's not allowing me to get to Zoom when I full screen it. Hold on. Let me see here. And while Dalen's working on that, um, I just want to remind everybody that, um, and I know I've said this a few times, that if you have any questions at the end, make sure you raise your hand. We really want to um, talk to you and, and answer your questions. Um, there, there's a lot of complex things going on. So if, if you didn't, you know, if it didn't quite click with you in this um, session, we're happy to do a one-off. Um, just let us know and we'll, we'll coordinate a time, time to meet with you and uh, go through this. If there's anything that's, you know, if you have an idea kind of bouncing around in your brain, we're happy to uh, collaborate with you too to help you uh, make that a, a reality. Um, and then again, you can always download files from the website and pick them apart. And uh, that's kind of a, a one way to learn how to set up files. Sorry, just want to jump in there real quick while you're working on that. No, I super appreciate it. I don't know why I'm having such a difficult time with this. Uh, let's see here. Let's do screen and then I don't, that's so weird. Cause if I hit play. There we go. Oh, oh it's, working. it's working oh, it's now. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, I don't know why that didn't work the first time. I did not do anything different. Computers. <laughs> Well, okay. In my defense, my laptop, she's 11 this year and she sounds like a jet taking off. So <laughs> we're all just doing our best. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> let's get into it, shall we? 
Um, so most of you should have received a card in the mail with uh, the piece in question that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the title of this piece is Iridophore, and I use white ink to achieve the spot holographic effect that you see on the python's body. Um, this first slide is just a nice close up uh, like on that scale detail, which I will get into more thoroughly as we go. Um, I just wanted to uh, have it for you guys to peek at, uh, assuming that you maybe don't have that card right in front of you. But if you do, you can also just obviously turn it around in the light and check it out. Um, when I talk about this piece, I'm going to be talking about my own workflow and my own strategies for preparing my art for this kind of specialty printing. Your workflow might look completely different, but I hope that by, you know, kind of getting into this and describing my own process, perhaps it sort of opens that box for you and you can start to think about your own art in maybe similar and maybe entirely different ways, but still with that same framework of uh, preparing for white ink or other effects in mind. Um, so this is the full piece as I photographed it in front of my fancy little curio cabinet. Um, it is uh, definitely a super cool one to see in person too, which I'm super excited about. Uh, but this is sort of like a general overview of my thoughts and feelings about illustrating with white ink or about specialty printing in general. Um, illustrating with white ink in mind requires a little bit more forethought than just sitting down and drawing. Um, and this slide is just sort of a basic overview of my thoughts about that. And again, I'll just get into more detail as we go. Um, white ink gives you a ton of control over which parts of your substrate are visible and in what ways. Um, and that means that you can and should be extremely intentional with where you place it. Um, the most successful pieces of art and design are the ones that this kind of thought is put into them right from the ground floor, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, I'm going to be mostly talking about that in the context of using holographic and foiled stock, uh, but the sky's kind of the limit there. Uh, this slide pretty much says it all. Successful designs are made with careful planning and a clear vision of what you want to have at the end. Um, and the nice part about white ink is that it gives you a ton of control over that substrate and a ton of control over how you execute that, uh, which is really, really cool and useful. Um, when you create these illustrations, you should be keeping your file structure and your end result in mind during the entire process. Uh, I am a perpetual layer flattener, um, and it's a habit born of working on older hardware where having fewer layers ends up making my computer run a little bit faster and my workflow go a little bit less confusing too because I'm not the kind of person who likes to dig through a ton of layers but uh whatever you do end up doing with your art you need to be thinking about that final result so that you are judicious with what you allow to be flattened be deleted be lost in some way versus what you choose to preserve to make your life a little bit easier later. Um, specialty printing can and does enhance the storytelling of an illustration. Uh, this kind of goes back to my thoughts about successful design in that first point, but I genuinely think that some of the most compelling and grabbing pieces of illustration and design are the ones that pique your interest in a way that like makes you ask a question or feel something or see it, it tells you something and when it's doing its job correctly you may not even notice that it's doing that uh, but you get something from that illustration and specialty printing is something that actually and absolutely allows you to alter the story that you're telling with an image uh in this case iridophore is um actually a scientific term and it is the scientific term for the keratin structure inside um, snake scales, the specific cells like keratin cells uh, that refract light in this way. There are real kinds of snake out in the world, uh, multiple species actually, uh, that have these iridophores. And when you pull them into the sunlight, uh, they shine with a rainbow iridescence the same way that an oil slick does. Uh, and one of them is actually, I own, uh, it's called a white-lipped python. I own one. I have some 
fun pictures at the end of the uh, at the end of the slideshow so you guys can just see I have the pet tax I'm paying the pet tax <laughs> um, but uh, this piece was sort of inspired by that it's inspired by the the wondrousness of the natural world if you say uh, you could say um so file prepping for white ink uh, this slide's pretty straightforward it's just a like a quick rundown of some things to keep in mind um, it is vitally important when you are illustrating just in general, but especially for something like this, that you prepare yourself an easy method to quickly select individual parts of your image. Now, whether that is flatting, which is the strategy that I use and I will go into in more detail, or it's keeping everything on separate layers in the first place, or some other thing. I mean, I know that Procreate actually supports saved selections where if you select something out, you can hit a little button that allows you to um, tell Procreate to remember that selection. And then you can come back and make that selection anytime again. Um, all of these are valid methods. Uh, Procreate is probably the hardest program to do this in, but I would argue that it can be done. <laughs> um, in my case, as an illustrator, I'm an extremely visual thinker. So uh, one of the things that I'm gonna go in today is basically how to create a separate layer that allows you to visualize where you're going to be putting that white ink on the page and gives you some control over tweaking that, You know, making sure that you have a, a, a clear idea of where everything is going to go. And then you can use that illustrated layer to create your selection channel. Um, I'm going to uh, like get into all of this stuff and how I sort of did it after the fact. I knew for a fact that with Arita 4 that I wanted that holographic effect from the ground up, but because this was my first time working with this kind of substrate and white ink, I ended up sort of like coming into it on the back end. Um, but these are all really, really important things to keep in mind so that you maybe don't have to futz through it on the back end like I do. Like it's much easier definitely to be thinking about these things and preparing them as you go. Um, so to prep your art for white ink application, I find it makes the most sense to make a layer in your file that allows you to edit, tweak, and envision where that white ink will go before you ever worry about translating that shape into a channel. It's not to say that you can't edit like Photoshop channels and paint into them and erase out of them and stuff. Um, but I find that it's just a little bit less, uh, it's a little bit less precise in some ways because of the ways that channels show up in Photoshop. You know, you're, you're filling sort of this, when you click on a channel, it fills it in with a, a color that you've set at an opacity that you've set. And if it makes sense to you to draw and paint directly into that channel, um, you absolutely can. But for me, it, I find that I can see it better and it makes more sense to me to differentiate those values outside of it and then take it into the channel when I feel like I'm done. Um, so uh, this looks obviously extremely strange, um, but it won't appear like this in the final print. And if you're brave, you can even delete it after you have uh, finished translating it into a channel. Uh, I wouldn't because I've lost too many things by deleting them over the years. But you know, again, it's different strokes for different folks. Your workflow is your workflow. Um, I'm going to get into how I made this after finishing my illustration. And again, it's worth noting that you don't have to wait until the end. You can be working on these things as you go. Um, so this next slide here. I am a comic artist by trade. So my preferred method of making easy selections is a process known as flatting. Flatting is when you make a separate layer beneath your art where you fill in each major space with a random and usually extremely ugly color. Um, and all of these fills are abutting against the next one. Um, each shape should be filled as an aliased shape, uh, which is very difficult to see on my screen, unfortunately. Uh, it's not the, the clearest, especially at a smaller scale. Um, but what you mean, what this means is that you want a shape that is extremely hard and sharp and jagged when you zoom in. If you imagine drawing in early versions of MS Paint and like when you would use the, uh, the, the spray paint tool or the pencil tool and those extremely, extremely sharp lines, that's what you're looking for. And that setting is up in your uh, top bar of Photoshop. There should be a box that you can tick um, where you want to have 
anti it says anti alias and you want to have that box unticked because aliasing is the act of which like it makes those lines a little bit softer around the edge um which can be really really great for printing especially if you are not printing like the most high resolution thing because uh, low resolution things that are aliased will look extremely jagged and kind of weird and pixelated. Um, so aliasing is an extremely useful tool, but knowing when to use anti-aliasing and aliasing in your art is uh, a, also a very, very helpful skill. Um, and you want these selections to be aliased because that, that means every single time you select, for example, the snake's body in green. Um, that selection is going to be exactly the same. It is going to pick up that exact same pixel border around that shape every time. It's not going to ignore, for example, the tiniest bit of fuzziness where like the shade of green mixes with the shade of pink. Because there is a single flat defined border in between the two, it means that every single time you're making exactly the same selection, which is very helpful. Um, I prefer this method over separating out every single layer of my piece. So every single flower and the snake and the eyes and the tongue and everything uh, into separate, separate layers, simply because it's a more economical use of my space and my hardware. Um, and it's fewer layers to navigate. I also really like the way that flatting allows you to select through and around things and preserve things like overlapping and other business um, without having to, for example, have a, a single petal of the peony on a separate layer on top of the snake where the rest of it is behind the snake and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I really, really like flatting because, you know, all of those overlaps are accounted for. You're making the exact same selection every time. It's super sharp. It's very versatile. Um, so once you have that done, whatever system you have in place, the ability to select the different parts of your image is like 90% of the battle. But what about the places where you want a gradient of white ink instead of a flat color? Um, this is a clever trick that works in Photoshop, Procreate, as well as Clip Studio Paint, which are my three preferred programs. I can't speak to anything else, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, this does work in kind of like the three... I would argue like the three sort of big boys of illustration right now. Um, I do find fair warning that Procreate's uh, selection tools can be kind of clunky and difficult. So uh, art for matter beware, <laughs> but it can be done. Uh, and this clever little trick is called using a gradient map. I am so sorry. I hope nobody can hear my puppy crying over there. She's kicking up a stink. Um, but anyway, um, you are going to be making a um, selection of the area that you are looking to uh, explore this spot white effect in. Uh, you are going to duplicate it. And then you are going to go down to that little half moon in the right hand corner and you're gonna hit that gradient map icon. Uh, and what you will get as a result is this. And this doesn't look terribly impressive when you do it in black and white, because you look at this and you're like, Daylin, why wouldn't you just hit like, edit desaturate or hue and saturation sliders and drag that, drag that saturation down? Well, I will show you. I will show you exactly why you, you wanna use a gradient map over those methods. Uh, and on this next slide, you will see. So the cool part about a gradient map is that what it does is it takes your image, that portion of the image or the full image, just depending on how you mask it out and what you do with it, uh, and it assigns a color to a certain range of values within that image. Um, so for example, uh, a black and white gradient is not like the best way to illustrate how this necessarily works but in this case it is assigning a black to the darker values and a white to the lighter values and um there's a bajillion different ways you can play this in an illustration for example if you do a blue to red to yellow gradient it will make all of your darkest places blue it will make all of your midtones in the reds and it will make all of your highlights in the yellows and the cool part about that is is that because it is mapping a gradient to those values, you are getting all of those intermediate colors as well. Um, 
which can be super, super handy for general illustration when you're adjusting, say, like the temperature of your image. If you want the highlights to be warmer and the shadows to be cooler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I won't get into that as, a, as an illustration technique um, today, but it is extremely helpful to use a gradient map because every single one of those little boxes on that gradient are called color stops. And those color stops can be altered however you please. Uh, they can be dragged in this top corner one. Essentially what I did um, was I took that white and I dragged it closer to the middle. And so that means that in this gradient, there is less black and there is more white. And what that does is that means it tells Photoshop or Procreate or Clip Studio Paint or whatever else you use, it tells that program that you want more of those values to be assigned to white versus black. Um, again, this is really handy because you can put these color stops, you can add as many as your heart desires and you can drag them wherever you want. Uh, so this bottom corner, what I did actually is I added another color stop to the very darkest parts of the image and I made that one white. So all of a sudden it's only the midtones that are black. All of the darkest darks and all of the lightest lights are white. Um, and obviously this is not a perfect single one stop and you're done kind of technique. Um, but I am finding that in my own workflow, this is a really, really handy way to get some of that detail preserved um, without having to necessarily go back in and paint it all yourself by hand. Uh, inevitably with a complicated spot white like this, you're probably not gonna be able to get away with not doing any painting at all. But if you're smarter than me, maybe you will because you will prep your layers beforehand. You never know. Um, but this is a really, really handy way to um, start to visualize where you can place white ink and uh, potentially like where those things will fall. Um, the cool part about uh, Iridophore's scales is that I was very intentional about trying to mimic the ways in which uh, light refracts through real scale, the real scales, uh, which is to say that lighter parts of the body are still iridescent, but not as prominently so. And it's hard to see the iridescence in between the scales. Um, so finally, I used a combination of gradient mapping, my line work that I had initially drawn and then obviously saved um, from, the, from my illustration. I had that kept on a separate layer and just duplicated it and fussed with it. Um, but this is a combination of using those uh, shape flats to fill in the whole rest of the area with white. I knew I didn't want any holographic to show through except on uh, the snake's body and also on my signature, which is my little my little stamp is not on this cropped version that you guys received in the mail, but it is on the full piece. The, the full piece has my little stamp holographic as well. Um, I knew those were the only places that I wanted to have that holographic effect shine. Um, and so I ended up with this image where I feel like I had everything pretty precisely painted where I wanted it. Um, and now in Photoshop, this is like the, the more complicated part of it um, because Photoshop doesn't have the best tools for taking a black and white image like this because this is all on one layer. Like I, I, put, this, I put this layer together and um, these are... This is a, a rasterized, pixeled, uh, black and white single image on a layer. Um, and what you want to do, obviously, is you want to make it so that you can make that, uh, that white knockout into a selection. And so to do that, it's easier if you get a little bit of that transparency selected out. Uh, in Clip Studio Paint, the really easy way to do this is you go into edit, convert brightness to opacity, and it turns all of your perfect whites into transparent and all of your shades of gray into different transparencies. So what I would do to do that is I would literally just invert the image, pull it into Clip Studio Paint if I wasn't already working in Clip in general, and I would hit that and then boom, I already have an automatic, perfectly done, transparent, pixeled image. Uh, in Photoshop, there's a little bit of a workaround for that. Uh, so what you are going to want to do is you are going to want to go into select and then color range. Uh, and you can look at my settings here. Uh, it'll take a little bit of messing with and you have to sort of 
screw with these settings based on what you want uh, out of your image. But um, the selection preview, you'll see that quick mask, which is again, that sort of pink shade that gives you an idea of where uh, your selection in this case will not be. Um, and you want to play with the, the fuzziness slider until it roughly looks like it's selecting all of what you want the white knockout to be. Uh, and in this case, I ended up turning the white knockout black just because it was easier for my brain to comprehend. Again, you do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but once you hit, uh, okay, create selection, uh, you will end up with a, um, you will end up with a selection that is uh, all of the, because you've, because you've increased the fuzziness, you will end up with a selection that is all of the black, but also selects like all of the sort of tones of gray in between, or most of them. This is not a process that I use quite as often because I think it's a little bit less precise um, than the other methods of just sometimes using a different program. But, you know, sometimes all you have is Photoshop and you got to make lemonade out of lemons. Um, but uh, once you have that selection made, you are going to create a new layer and you are going to fill that layer with color. And that way you can't, you can't uh, invert it and just hit like the delete button because that will delete some of the white, but it will leave some of those grays and those grays will still be opaque. So that will not be useful in creating a selection. Um, and then what that allows you to do with that filled layer is you can go back through and alter it however you please. Uh, if some things didn't get caught, you can continue to, to tweak that and refine it. Uh, or if it's close enough to what you want, you can go straight to the next step, which is using that selection to create a channel. Uh, and obviously Alex has gone into plenty of detail about how to do this. Um, but again, I really like to make a separate layer like this because then all you have to do is take that separate transparent layer, right click on it and hit create selection, like selection from layer, I believe is the is the exact verbiage. Um, and from there you have that selection and you can create that new, new channel and rename it at your leisure. Um, and then bada boom, you have your channel. <laughs> um, so that is a just general rundown about how I manage to take this illustration and format the white knockout to be as, as detailed as it was. It was a combination of gradient mapping using my previous line work and also the other considerations I have in place for easy selection in my in my file. Um, so the other thing I wanted to get into a little bit while I'm here is just talking about the differences between using white ink on a foiled substrate versus foil on top. Uh, I think both of them are extremely cool and extremely beautiful effects and you really can't go wrong, but it is worth uh, noting the differences between the two, I would say. And this probably was a segment that might've been a little bit more at home at the shimmer and shine, but whatever, I got my time and I wanna talk about it. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna. Um, so this piece on the uh, left-hand side is, uh, it's called Run Wild and it's, well, it's a diptych, it's two pieces. Um, but these were the first pieces that I actually printed with Indigo Ink. Um, and uh, on this next slide, you'll be able to look in a little bit closer at them. And there are some pros and cons of using this uh, this holographic foil that is pressed on top of the image rather than coming up from beneath the, the printed ink. Um, this stuff is super striking. It's really reflective. It is impossible to miss when you have it hanging up. I do some comic conventions for a living. Um, and uh, it just grabs you by the throat when you walk past, as soon as it catches the light. It is so in your face, it's amazing. Uh, the contrast of that foil with the matte laminate that protects the other parts of the image from being foiled makes them so luxurious feeling. I always have people who are very impressed with the weight of the prints, with the soft touch of them, and with the way that that foil flashes compared to the softness of the rest of the print. Uh, customers love these. Um, the one drawback is that, as you can see in my little inset picture, the unpredictability of paper does mean that alignment issues can occur. And this is like not on indigo. It's totally on me. This was a first time that I was designing with this kind of precision in mind. And paper does shrink and grow and change a little bit as it goes through those machines, as it is exposed to heat and the differing differences in like humidity from day to day, paper is, paper's temperamental. Um, so this is something that like, 
most of my prints turned out super, super awesome and perfect, but occasionally there was one that was in the, in the first run that was a little bit skewed. And so that's something that you need to, if you're going to do this, you're going to need to anticipate that. Um, but for the most part, I don't know, they all turned out really, <laughs> really amazing. So like, I wouldn't say that it's not worth the risk. I just, I think that in other iterations, or if I were to try and do this kind of effect again, I would keep that much more strongly in mind. And I would place those small details in places where it would be much, much less obtrusive if they were slightly misaligned. By contrast, this one is printed on holographic stock with a layer of white knockout. And then finally, um, the CMYK printing on top. Uh, the cool part about this is, is that it gives you a ton of control over where that foil shows and what your image looks like. You have, it supports gradients, which the other foiling does not. Like it supports all this kind of like immense, super like precise detail. The, um, the alignment issues there are nearly impossible to clock if you can see them at all. Uh, I don't think I found a single print with an alignment issue. I don't even know if I would know what to look for, you know? <laughs> like a single point of white ink spreading makes so much less of a difference on an image like this. Um, there, The cool part about this as well is that different foil patterns are available. Um, Shiloh, can you, can you not rip up the box right here? <laughs> Pardon me, hopefully you guys can't hear that. Um, different foil patterns are available for customization. So for example, if you look at some of the uh, foils that Indigo Ink has available, uh, there are some incredible, interesting sort of melty patterns, magma, lava kind of patterns. Uh, imagine, if you will, uh, a scenario where you paint a, a nebulous skyscape and you use a bunch of those colors to bring the depth of space into that area, but then you use white as little knockouts for the stars. Like there's a lot of ways in which you can use this textural element underneath to enhance your illustration and to enhance its storytelling and its visuals uh, in a way that sometimes may save you a little bit of drawing as well, which I think is extremely cool. Um, the only sort of like, I wouldn't even necessarily call them drawbacks, but considerations you need to have when you are printing on holographic stock like this is that one of the major ones is that your colors are going to change when you are printing on a silver base versus a bright white base. Uh, thankfully, the kind folks at Indigo Ink are really, really good about helping you tweak your colors and adjust things so that they come out like a little bit closer to what you had envisioned. I personally didn't feel like, especially printing dark colors like this, I didn't feel like the silver made too much of a difference. But if you wanted something to be like bright holographic, it would take a little bit of doing. I don't think it could, it couldn't be done, but definitely it's something that you want to have in the back of your mind as you draw and as you illustrate. Um, the only other thing, and again, this is like less of a drawback and just more of a, a feature, is that because there is a gloss coating on top of this, um, uh, on top of this image, there isn't the same contrast between the foil and the substrate, uh, which means that from some angles, it doesn't have quite the same like bright in your face silver flash. That said, it's still like really beautiful. And I think sometimes that subtlety is also really, really beneficial to the image. Uh, it really just is all to do with the effect that you want and how you want it to read and how you want it to be seen. In an image like this, having that silver foil on top wouldn't work. It just would not, it wouldn't read the same way. So it's definitely less, uh, that one is not really a drawback, but it's just a consideration that you should have. Um, and from there, you know, just my final little rundown, which is why white ink just gives you a ton of control. Um, it allows you to have very, like a very precise say in where your substrate is showing and where it is hidden. And that is a, an extremely useful thing to have, whether that's with foil substrates or dark papers, colored papers. Um, it is, uh, the possibilities are kind of endless. You can really think outside the box when you have white ink in your arsenal. Uh, white ink is super consistent from print to print. Uh, it is much more precise to lay down and less likely to have those alignment issues, uh, which again, like, the alignment issues are not that bad, just worth considering when you are designing and also when you are printing. 
Um, white ink can add a subtle texture and detail that isn't even necessarily there in the in the actual illustration. Uh, I think that one of the coolest parts about this iridophore print is the way that you can turn it around in the light. And even when that holographic is not catching, you can still see that scale texture and that detail. I think that adds something really special and really interesting to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like white ink opens the door to a bajillion different kind of interesting printing effects. And I would encourage everybody to think outside the box. And then finally, it's time for some pet tax. <laughs> uh, the next slide features some images of a real life snake. So if you have phobias, sorry, beware, maybe look away for a second. I promise I won't linger on them too long. Um, but I wanted to talk for a second about this piece and just sort of like why I decided to make it in the first place. And the reason why I decided to make it in the first place is because I am the owner of a white lipped python named Dagger. So this is my real animal. These are real photos and videos that I have taken of him. Uh, he is a sub-adult white-lipped python. Uh, they are an extremely interesting and cool animal. And um, one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years of having him is that I have shared him online occasionally. Just, I mean, look at him. He's gorgeous. It's hard not to. Um, but I wanted to create a Ritifor as a way to uh, sort of uh, allow people to appreciate and even hold that effect of this like beautiful animal in their hands without necessarily without necessarily encouraging people to go out and buy themselves an animal that they aren't prepared to care for. Um, white lips pythons are not a beginner snake. They have uh, a higher level of heat, humidity, substrate, sort of uh, differing uh, husbandry and care needs than the average person is probably prepared to provide for them. Um, and so Iridophore was sort of my way of telling everybody like, thank you so much for liking my snake uh, and thinking that these animals are as cool and amazing as I do. And if you want to own a little piece of that without being responsible for a python for the next 20 to 30 years, because they are also extremely long lived animals, like this is the way to do it. And it was a, a really cool way to sort of spread a little bit of awareness and education about a uh, an animal that is often very misunderstood. A lot of people don't like snakes and I completely empathize, phobias are phobias, um, but I'm very passionate about herpetology and I really wanted to, to use my illustration as a way to sort of spread that. Anyway, my last little slide is just the final piece again, um, but that pretty much wraps up my segment. So hope you enjoy. Amazing. <laughs> Galen, I'm, I'm really impressed with how well you captured the snake in art. Thank you. In comparison to real life. I mean, now that I see the, the real snake that this is based on, I'm even more amazed. He is such, such a gorgeous creature. Like, yeah, I do pretty, not believe pretty cool. that I just wake up in the morning and I, I live in a house where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> really, really awesome. Um, thank and it was you for really sharing. Cool. Yeah, I mean, like, thank you guys for yeah. uh, constantly yes-anding me when I have a bunch of crazy ideas. Like, I... I need only send Alex a, a message or an email to say like, hey, I kind of have this like weird idea that I want to execute. What do you think about this? And he's like, well, it might break the press, but like, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. We're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, but thank you so much. Yeah, With that, the webinar is concluded. We want to thank you all for attending today and we hope you learned something new. Our next class is already in the planning stages, and we'll be discussing file setup for digital die cutting, design principles of folding cartons and three-dimensional paper craft, as well as some creative applications of digital plotter technology. Look for that to come in the new year. Now I'll turn things over to Matt and Liz to organize Q&A and collect some questions. Hey there, everybody. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Dalen. Uh, one other thing to mention, um, in addition to the, the cool things that Alex just showed you, uh, for the upcoming uh, talk, like you said, we're going to talk about setup for die cutting. Uh, but on um, Halloween, uh, Alex, Liz, and Pete Birch put together an amazing video that shows off another cool thing that we are experimenting with, and it's Scratch Off Inc. Um, there's so many different applications. We're really excited about it. Um, if you haven't followed us on Instagram, please do so, and you'll be able to find that video there. And, and Liz, is it anywhere else right now? Is it on YouTube? Yes, I'm putting a link in here. Okay, cool. Um, you got check it out. It looks really cool. It's it's one of my favorite videos we've ever made.
Um, so, so the, does any, so we are, sorry. we are definitely over time. So we're going to keep Q and a super brief. If anybody on the call has a question, um, we'll take like another 60 seconds, um, for that. But if anybody wants to follow up, send us an email to order at indigoinkprint.com. We're happy to follow up with, um, individually with any questions that you have. That's Hannah. Hey, hi. Hannah. Um, hi. So I was just wondering, wondering if you could clarify with the last piece, um, Galen's piece. So the entire substrate is like, is holographic paper or was it foil stamped holographic and then printed white on top in CMYK? If you could just clarify like the um, mm -hmm. basically what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. The entire substrate is holographic paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank and you. and the white, she used the white as a tool, as a way to block out a lot of the holographic, so it only showed up where she wanted it um, on the snake scales. Okay. There is a ton of white ink on that piece. Um, so anywhere that you are not seeing that holographic effect, you're seeing four layers of white ink plus CMYK. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense. Good question. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? And then don't forget, like Liz said, and, and like I mentioned earlier, if if you think of something as the days or the weeks or months go on and you want to reach out to us and um, get any advice or, or bounce some ideas around, we're always happy to, to do that and, cl and collaborate. And Alex is um, always happy to do some test prints and, uh, you know, we'll ship them out to you so you can see it in, in real life. That's that's really how it's going to pop. Uh, Liz put up a um, email address um, in addition to that YouTube video that I mentioned that shows off scratch off ink. Um, other than that, it looks like there's no more questions. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and Dalen, thanks again for you know taking the time out of your day and sharing part of your process. Um, and we always love collaborating with you. Uh, we feel very fortunate. Uh, to to be able to work with so many amazing designers, and you're definitely one of them. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Thank you guys for Good. like listening to me ramble on about my process and my pet snake. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the snake. I I think it's beautiful. He's a cool dude. I like him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Thanks I think so much, that wraps everybody. it up. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you so much for coming, everybody.